ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining our webinar today. Uh, my name is Megan Mallory. I'm PHA's Associate Director of Publications. I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar on creative expression. Um, so <coughs> the arts and healing, what is the connection? Um, it really is no co coincidence that Apollo is the Greek god of art and of medicine. Um, and as I'm sure you're already aware because you're on this webinar, these two areas of art and medicine are very connected. Um, whether it's patient stories, nurses' anecdotes, families' chronicles, the experiences of these storytellers help heal those who tell the stories and those who read or hear the stories. Um, in this introduction that I'm giving, I'm going to be referencing a DVD called Writing for Your Health by Dr. Lester Friedman. And at the end of the presentation, I'll let you know how you can get your own copy of this DVD. <clears throat> um, Dr. Friedman spoke at PHA's 2004 International Conference, and he spoke on the subject, The Heart of the Matter, Expressing Illness Through the Arts. Um, in this DVD, Dr. Friedman links creative expression, writing, drawing, photography, you name it, um, with reduced symptoms in patients. In the DVD, Dr. Friedman refers to a 1994 study. This study showed that subjects who wrote about stressful experiences for 20 minutes a day, three days a week, fared better than those who didn't, and better than those who wrote on neutral subjects. So how can this information help us? Dr. Friedman says that the expressing of self is the pathway to healing, not only of the body, but of the mind, the spirit, and perhaps even the soul. Basically, he's saying that the way we think about and describe our experiences to ourselves and to others influences how we think about ourselves and those experiences. This is also called narrative therapy. This type of therapy aims to help patients reframe their stories in more positive, empowering ways. So if you've ever tried to cheer someone up and help them see the positive side of something, then you are actually participating in narrative therapy. Dr. Friedman in this DVD also emphasizes sharing. Um, when patients and families share their stories and information, the illness becomes destigmatized and treatment becomes easier to seek and easier to handle. We are healthier both emotionally and physically when we share knowledge and emotions with each other. And actually that's really the main reason why Pathlight and Persistent Voices within Pathlight um, was created. And that's why um, PHA has our journeys online. And it's really why we're all together here today for this webinar. Uh, because the sharing and creating of common ground helps people connect and empathize with each other, both literally and emotionally. And we can do this around any form of creative expression, whether it be my preferred uh, form, I really love to write, or whether it's through artwork, as Janet will talk about in um, just a minute. So that's just some general information, and so let's, let's get on with the sharing. Um, first we'll hear from Janet, and then we'll open up the phone lines to everyone. And I really hope um, that you know, we've been sharing a little bit already, and I really welcome more of that sharing um, as we continue. So I'm really excited to invite Janet into this conversation because her experiences will more clearly highlight what I've been talking about and what Dr. Friedman uh, talks about in his DVD. Janet is an active artist, and she recently wrote an article about creative expression for the fall issue of Pathlight. Um, be on the lookout for that issue to arrive in your mailboxes this month. Uh, we just got the copies in the office, so that I know it's on, on its way to everybody's mailboxes soon. Uh, Janet was diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension in 2008. She has worked as a patient advocate since the 1980s and currently maintains a website and international forum for rare genetic muscle disease. She is a personal trainer and nutritional consultant living in Colorado, and she enjoys photography and painting as her preferred creative expression methods. But that's really enough about me telling you who she is. I'd really like her to tell you herself, um, and I'm going to start off our discussion with her with this question. Um, Janet, many people think that artistic tendencies are something you're born with. Can you give us a little background about your early years and how they influence you to become an artist? Sure. Um, I I did show creative potential early in life, but I'm not real sure it was appreciated by the people around me <laughs> at that time. <laughs> um, I loved books, and I remember studying the pictures even when I was very young. I was just fascinated by the colors and the styles in the books. And uh, like probably most of you, I had a lot of books and coloring books. And after I'd mastered coloring in the lines, which seems to be the first rule that we're given as children, 
uh, in, artistically, I tried to find something else to make coloring more exciting. So I made up a game that I played with my French poodle named Jacques. And uh, what I would do is put my coloring book on the floor, I'd lay out all the crayons in a row, and then I'd put my finger on the part of the picture that I was going to color next. And then I'd say, Jacques, pick out a crayon. So he'd walk over and he'd nose one of the crayons, and that's the color I would use. It wouldn't matter what color, I took whatever he went with. So this is a typical example of what our joint artistic efforts look like. <laughs> the colors weren't, they, they were kind of fantasy colors. They didn't really match what were, you know, what something really looked like, but we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, I, I think that children are naturally creative, but eventually we're introduced to rules that squelch that creativity. And we're shaped by the opinions and the criticism of our teachers and our peers, and often we become self-conscious about expressing our unique perspectives of the world, whether it's through art or writing or some other creative outlet. Um, a turning point for me was when I was 14 and I attended a summer fine arts camp at the University of Arizona. I decided to give oil painting a try, so I took a two-week workshop. And when I was putting the final touches on my painting, a young man who was already quite an accomplished artist came up to me and he asked if I was finished. So I blushed and I thought he was going to compliment me. And, and instead he said, okay, then can I have your canvas to paint over because we're short of materials. And so that ended my pursuit of art. I thought, that's it, you know, I'm not even interested. Um, so I'm telling you this because all of us, I think, if we think back, we have negative experiences that impacted us as children and young adults and undermined our self-confidence as far as creative expression. Maybe it was just red marks on your English paper um, or it could have been comments like what I heard. But they keep us from taking risks and exploring our creativity. And in my case, I lost for decades what could have been a source of great enjoyment. Now, I know you've written about health challenges um, before being diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. How did that impact your life, and did you have an outlet for creative expression during those years? Um, I was born with four rare genetic diseases that include a skeletal muscle disorder called myotonia congenita and a connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I have a blood disorder called porphyria and a metabolic disease called hypophosphatemia. So the pH was the icing on the cake. Uh, my doctors were quite ignorant about all these various conditions and told my mother that I was just an overly anxious child and was probably trying to get attention by complaining. My mother called me a hypohertiac, and she would tease me whenever I'd express concern about symptoms like choking or walking stiffly or having abdominal pain. And it wasn't until my mid-20s that we began to realize that I had valid medical issues, and it has really taken years to sort all of that out. So um, in spite of all those physical problems, I had many very enjoyable pursuits, including work as a photojournalist. I worked as a bookkeeper for a business. I was an artist rep for several years. And um, later, I became a personal trainer and worked as a doula for women in labor. And I was a nutritional consultant. And my creative outlets during that time were mostly writing photography, I loved needlework, and uh, music. I played in the symphony. And this, was, um, this definitely helped me cope with day-to-day -day struggles of dealing with chronic health conditions. And, um, and I think most people find some kind of outlet, but when you're diagnosed with a condition like PH, um, sometimes you, you have to start giving up those, those pursuits for one reason or another. I'm going to jump in here again because um, it sounds like you adapted your health challenges and you were doing well. Um, when you were diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension, how did that change your life? In uh, 2003, I was standing in the parking lot of a restaurant with my family members, and I looked down and I saw a mosquito biting my arm. And it wasn't just biting my arm, it was actually poking the little thing in the, the vein where they take blood from your arm. So whatever the mosquito had, it was going right into my bloodstream. So we'd had an outbreak of West Nile virus that summer in Colorado. And I swatted the mosquito, and I said kind of jokingly, you better not have West Nile. 
And then five days later, I had neuroinvasive West Nile virus, which means I had meningitis and encephalitis, and my whole life changed just like that. And uh, apparently the virus damaged my immune system. It damaged all the nerve roots in my spinal cord. Um, I remember mm-hmm. developing shortness of breath, respiratory issues for the first time in my life. In fact, that fall, I went up into the mountains like I usually do to take pictures of the fall leaves. And I just had walked down a trail to get a few shots. But when I started to walk back up, my heart started pounding like crazy, and, and I started to black out. And it took me a very long time to get back to my car. I was by myself, no cell phone coverage out there. So I would have to take, uh, walk a few yards, and I'd stop, put my head down, uh, rest for a while. And I really, it felt like my heart was just going to blow out of my chest. And it was one of the scariest experiences of my life. And uh, as my health continued to decline, I had all kinds of tests, inc- including an echo, but no one ever recognized the signs of uh, PAH. In 2008, I contracted another virus called cytomegalovirus, or CMV, and that caused a crisis leading to heart and liver failure. I asked to be transferred to University of Colorado Hospital in Denver, and within a few days I was told I had severe right-sided heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, and kidney cancer. And I was so sick I couldn't walk. I had to be in a nursing facility for a month. And then even after I was home, I still couldn't walk for quite some time. I had to use a wheelchair. My cardiologist just shook his head when I asked about the prognosis. He, he didn't expect me to live much longer. How, how did the diagnosis affect you mentally? Um, I felt very defeated. I didn't tolerate any of the medications normally used to treat pulmonary hypertension. So I knew it was basic, basically a, a death sentence for me being at uh, stage four like that. I drew on my years of experience as a nutritional consultant, and I tried to find alternative treatments. And I was actually successful at reducing the symptoms of heart failure. But my pulmonary pressure was still high enough to classify, um, classify me as severe. And I began to get really depressed. The more I read about it, the more depressed I got. Uh, I'm sure many of you remember the story of Pollyanna. Remember her GLAD game and how she was always cheering everybody up? And, uh, but e- even the most optimistic and cheerful person can become overwhelmed by circumstances that are out of their control. I had to give up so many things in those following months. I had never been completely dependent on others before, and that was very difficult for me. I began mourning all the things that were lost to me. I couldn't walk around the block without collapsing, and I used to love to go hiking. Uh, I think all of you can relate to the sense of loss and grief when you realize that this is a condition that isn't going to go away. I created a little cemetery in my mind where I buried all my dreams for the future and even things that had brought me joy in the past, and I think that's probably what we call depression. Over the next few years, I was basically just surviving. So what changed, and how did you rediscover your desire for creative expression? Well, Colorado is a beautiful place to live, but when you have pulmonary hypertension and you can't get out of the cold, um, which in my case it would always tighten the pulmonary arteries and then I'd get heart failure, um, the winters can seem like a prison out here. And this year, our winter just seemed to go on and on and on. I was getting to the point where I didn't really want to live anymore. I I was in a tremendous amount of pain from other health issues that I had, and I was just worn down. And out of desperation, I just said, God, give me a hope for my future and something to help me rediscover the joy of living. And on one of my infrequent outings, on a whim, I just decided to visit an arts and crafts store after I bought my groceries. I wandered up and down the aisles, and I tried to figure out if there was anything I would have the energy or the motivation to do. My joints were so painful at that time, I could no longer do needlework or knitting, things like that. Um, And I didn't think I was creative enough to try something like scrapbooking. Um, So as I passed the art supplies, a little kit caught my eye. It was a watercolor pencil set and it had a brush and pencils and a little instruction book. And I think there was a spark of my old love for coloring that must have gotten through, so I decided to buy the set. 
And over the next few weeks, I went through the booklet, and I learned some of the basic techniques that they taught in there. Um, with watercolor pencil, you, you actually kind of color it just like you would in a coloring book. Then you take uh, the brush and you wet it, and um, you can do different things to make it look like watercolor paints. So I did a few little drawings for my grandkids, and I, I found out it was really kind of fun. Um, as I let go of some of my adult insecurities about my creativity, I looked forward to just playing with colors and reawakening that childlike joy that I used to feel when I was drawing and coloring and painting. And as the snow kept falling through March and April and May, I began to take the pursuit of art more seriously. So I checked out some books from the library. I watched videos online, and I moved from watercolor pencils to watercolor paints. I started out with very inexpensive materials. My first real painting was a St. Bernard done with a paint kit that cost about $4. Unfortunately, I also used very inexpensive paper that buckled terribly, so I decided it was worth investing in heavier paper for my future paintings. I found that drawing and watercolor painting weren't taxing physically. In fact, I could just sit on the couch and watch TV in the evenings and do little sketches with pen and ink, and later add a watercolor wash if I wanted to give it some color. Now you have to understand this is a big leap for me because for almost 40 years I had done virtually nothing with art. Even little stick figure drawings made people laugh because they were so bad. So, um, so don't use the excuse that you're not creative or you, you can't do art because if anybody had asked me, I would have said, no way, um, that, that's just not my thing. Soon I realized my depression was disappearing, and I didn't have to give myself a pep talk to get up in the morning. And even my goth wardrobe changed, and my wardrobe was um, mostly black and you know, dark colors. And I started choosing bright colored clothing, and I even picked out some neon pink and green, which was real shocking for me. <laughs> uh, when did you start noticing a change um, in your physical condition? I think I first noticed it that spring uh, going up some stairs. And since I usually use an elevator in my complex, um, because when I'd go up the stairs, I'd have to stop every few steps just to keep from passing out. I'd see stars, and by the time I actually got up to my third floor uh, apartment, I was really out of it. Um, so suddenly I was able to walk up a flight of stairs without stopping until I got to the landing. Now, that was a huge thing for me. These are actually, this is actually pictures of my stairs here. Um, so I, I, I noticed again that within a few more weeks, I could go two flights of stairs without stopping. And then I noticed I could bend over and I could squat down. And my heart didn't go nuts. I would uh, have a lot of tachycardia and all kinds of problems when it just bending over. So as my mental state improved, I spent more time researching various supplements that might help, and I found one in particular that made a huge difference in my exercise tolerance. Uh, remember, I couldn't take any medications for pulmonary hypertension. So to see a change for the first time in the opposite direction, in other words, not going downhill, was really a great encouragement for me. I think sometimes when you're dealing with a chronic illness, just getting a little momentum going back the other direction can create a foundation that you can build on for even more improvement. When I went in for my pulmonology and cardiology check in May, the echo showed that my RVSP had dropped into the 50s, which was really amazing for me. That was so unusual that my doctor put in the notes that it was probably an error in the technician's measurements, but I knew better. <laughs> um, I could feel the difference. The changes became even more evident when my husband and I went for a few hikes at the beginning of the summer. And when I say hikes, you know, just little very, very simple things. But the, one of them, we decided to walk a little further. You know, he'd say, you're feeling okay? And I'd say, yeah, let's keep going. And we'd go a little further. And, uh, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. So uh, I couldn't even walk around the block the year before. Just walking from a parking lot into a store, I'd be exhausted. Sometimes I'd just have to turn around and go home because I was too tired to go shopping by the time I got in the store. So we figured out a way for my husband to carry my portable oxygen concentrator with me walking behind him, and I was kind of tethered by the tubing. So that's him in the lower right corner there. He's got my concentrator strapped on, and 
he's looking way in the distance at this little lake, a little blue lake way down there. And he said, um, that's where we're going to go hiking. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> so uh, I had to stop several times to rest. Going down wasn't horrible, but coming back was quite a challenge. But it was the first time in eight years that I had done something that felt really normal, like something I did in my previous life. So I was able to sit by the lake and do some watercolor painting while my husband was fishing. And I had a little tiny field kit that you can get with watercolors, and um, it was a lot of fun. And that led to one of the best summers I've ever had. We started. I got up and started walking every morning, and I worked up to about a mile and a half a day. Uh, around my area. I spent some time with some of my grandchildren, which I had not been able to do before because my immune system was so bad that uh, we couldn't even risk me being around children. And so I was able to be my, around my grandchildren. Uh, and you know, I don't know what the future holds for me, but even if my condition deteriorates again, I was able to create some really great memories with my family. And I overcame what seemed to be insurmountable odds mentally and physically to get there. That's really great. What are some specific ways you feel your art helped you um, with that healing process? I think one of the most significant ways painting helped me was focusing on subjects that I enjoyed or that helped me process some negative emotions. For instance, when I was a child, I loved visiting a place called Grant's Farm outside of St. Louis. And it's the home of the Budweiser Clydesdales and I was crazy about horses and dogs, so I remember in particular the first time I saw a Dalmatian in real life. And painting a little sketch of a Dalmatian kind of allowed me to go back in time and recall those outings. As, as you're painting, you, your mind just, it triggers memories, and it, you just kind of think through um, all those things, and, and it's great when you pick a, a happy subject like that. It brings back memories of your childhood or... Uh, you know, a, a great time that you had with your family or friends. Um, the week before Mother's Day, I decided to paint a portrait of my mom from a photo taken back in the 50s. Now, during the months that I was so ill from heart failure, my mother was in a nursing home with Alzheimer's. In fact, we were in the same nursing home. She was, like, on the top floor and I was on the bottom floor um, with my heart failure. And she still recognized me at that time, but I was just too sick to even visit with her. And I was so sick for many, many more months that I just had very little time with her. And she passed away a year later. And I had nightmares about not being there for her when she needed me most. So as I worked on this painting and I focused on remembering my mom when she was younger and she was healthier, the nightmares started fading and I was able to forgive myself for not being there for her. And I think pursuing forgiveness, whether it's forgiving yourself or forgiving others, is one of the greatest benefits of creative expression. Anger and guilt are really powerful negative emotions, and they will literally drain the life from you. So, uh, again, art helped me very much, I think, in that area. Art is also a way of fulfilling dreams that aren't necessarily practical or attainable in real life. For instance, I love dogs, but my condo complex doesn't allow pets. So when my husband showed me a picture of an adorable little Weimaraner puppy, I gave him a virtual home through my painting, and I didn't even have to housebreak him. <laughs> um. <clears throat> In case others participating in the webinar would like to explore painting um, as their creative expression, can you share some tips with us for getting started? Sure. I already mentioned I got started with watercolor pencils, and then I graduated to paints. Um, these are actually my supplies. Uh, I chose watercolor because it has such a low toxicity. There are a few pigments that you have to avoid, avoid in watercolor um, if you get into the actual artist grade paints. The ones the Student grade kits will have a little stamp on them that say non-toxic, um, and those are fine. But a lot of the um, more advanced paints, they do have some toxic pigments in them, so you have to read the labels carefully. Uh, cleanup is just soap and water, which is nice if you spill some paint. I painted the St. Bernard that I showed earlier with the set of Prang watercolors on the left, which is just like what you would find in elementary school. and um, 
the set in the middle is called Artist Loft. It's from Michaels. It's their, their store brand. It's also very inexpensive, I think $4 for all those colors. And uh, the problem with the cheaper student and academic grade paints is that the pigments can fade and even disappear. So you might paint something, you really love it, you want to frame it, put it on the wall, and you look a few months later and half the colors are gone. So uh, that's why it's important, if you're serious, to go ahead and move into the, the artist grade paints. And they're, they're kind of expensive. I pay between 5 and $8 a tube for the paints like you see on the right. But they just a dab will last me sometimes for weeks of that one color on my palette. So they go a really long way. Brushes come in a variety of sizes and shapes, and each artist kind of develops their own preference. My favorite brushes were only a few dollars each. So if you don't have much money to spend on brushes, I mean, you can pay up to $60 for a sable brush. But oh, obviously, I wasn't going to do that. So you don't have to spend a fortune. I recommend American Painter and Simply Simmons brands, which are available from Michaels or Hobby Lobby. They're kind of considered beginner, but um, you know they work fine. I, I did fine with mine. Paper is the one thing you shouldn't skimp on. Watercolor paper can buckle and get real wavy if the weight is too low. So you should go for a 140-pound weight at least. It goes up to 300 pounds. You can find these in pads, different size pads like I have here. Um, there's also something called watercolor blocks, and they are pads of about 10 to 15 sheets, and they have glue all the way around the edges. So when the paper gets wet, it holds it tight as it's drying, so you don't have to stretch it. Um, watercolor paper usually requires stretching or stapling or taping or something to keep it flat. Um, and that's a whole different topic, but uh, you can, if you're interested, you can watch some videos or read some books dealing with that. I think it's easiest just to get a block and not worry about it. Different brands have different sizing, and this affects the durability of the paper. Mm. I started with some cheaper brands, and I'm now working exclusively on Arches, which is the one in the middle, which is considered a professional grade. As far as um, coupons, I would encourage you to sign up for emails from Michaels and Hobby Lobby if you're at all interested in arts and crafts, because they regularly offer 40 to 50 percent off any one item, and that can really add up over time. They are also um, some really good online art supply stores, and they make shopping really easy, and they're pretty competitive on their prices also. As far as space, you don't need a studio to start painting, at least not with watercolor. I have a table uh, and a stool, so my space is maybe five feet by six feet in the corner of my office. It's right under a window, so I get real good natural light. You need um, a palette. You need a, a water container, and mine's just an empty blue bunny container. And you need a waterproof surface. As far as classes uh, for instruction, if you're able to get out and take classes, that's great. There are many community art centers, adult education programs. Uh, they usually have them in high schools in the evenings, and senior centers that offer beginning art classes. There are also ways to learn online, which is what I did, including hundreds of YouTube videos on all kinds of subjects related to art. I subscribe to an online service called Artistnet TV. Um, I'm sorry, Artistnetwork.tv. I can watch hours of workshops and seminars by well-known artists, and this has probably been my greatest source for learning. Now, if you want to do acrylic, charcoal drawing, it has everything you can imagine on there, and you can just um, click on the seminar that you want to watch. Most of them are a couple of hours, and, and you learn uh, really well. I think that way it's just like being there in a workshop. That sounds really great. Um, do you have any last uh, final thoughts you want to uh, leave with our participants before we open it up for questions? Sure. I would encourage everyone to explore creative expression, whether it's art or writing or photography, crafts, music. Our senior center even has a class in belly dancing, which you're not going to find me at that one, but they do consider dancing a creative <laughs> expression. Um, don't be afraid to try something new. It is really rejuvenating. Uh, some of the greatest artists have been mentally and physically challenged. In fact, those challenges were often what made them great. Just the other day, I was reading a book um, about Vincent Van Gogh. And it mentioned that his doctor gave him the drug digitalis, which you might recognize as a heart drug, to try to help him with his various ailments. 
similar to the way Revadio can cause you to see a bluish tint, Digitalis can cause people to see a yellow tint and halos around objects. So what if we had missed the starry night because Vincent van Gogh was healthy? So when, when you feel confident enough, share your work with others. We have different abilities and disabilities, but there's a whole world of creative expression waiting to be found. And these creations are the footprints that we leave behind. Thank you so much, Janet.